Hello again, everybody. Uh, now we're moving on to the cosmological argument for the existence of God. So this is our final of the big three arguments for the existence of God. We've already gone over the ontological argument, the teleological. Now we're moving on to the cosmological. <clears throat> so we'll just state the argument again quickly. First premise, every being that exists or ever did exist is either a dependent being or a self-existent being. Premise two, not every being can be a dependent being. Therefore, there exists a self-existent being. So, what's going on here? I mean, so here's the rough idea. Uh, every being that ever exists or did exist uh, is dependent or self-existent. Right? So it's saying there are two options for explaining a being's existence. It can either depend on something else or it can depend on itself. The first one's easy to make sense of. So you and I are dependent beings, right? Whether or not there's a God, we depend on uh, others for our existence, namely our parents and their parents and their parents. Right, so if our great grandparents never got together, uh, then our grandparents would have never been born, our parents wouldn't have been born, and we wouldn't have been born. Right, so we depend on a lot of people actually. We depend on this entire chain of beings existing and getting together at the times they did, uh, such that we come into existence down the road. Right, so we are very dependent beings. Um, so the same is true of any any person any animal, so on and so forth. Uh, so it's pretty clear what a dependent being is. We're an example of it. Now, what what is a self-existent being? This is difficult to get a handle on. Um, roughly, it just means that it doesn't depend on anything else for its cause. Right? So dependent beings, we depend on something else to explain our existence. A self-existent being doesn't have to depend on anything else. It can just depend on itself. Uh, so many have thought that God is supposed to be a self-existent being. Right? One reason why you might think God is supposed to be a self-existent being uh, comes to us from uh, Anselm's discussion of self-existence, uh, which we've covered roughly before when we talked about the idea of God, but we'll go into some detail here. Uh, Anselm essentially says there's three ways we could explain something's existence. It could be dependent, it could depend on nothing, right? So there's no explanation, there's just something that exists. Or it depends on itself for its existence. And Anselm just says, well, look, God can't be a dependent being because then God would depend for his existence on some other being, right? And then that being would be greater than God because that being created God. Uh, so that can't be the case, right? God can't depend on somebody else. Uh, God can't be explained by nothing. And this is, we'll talk about this in more detail later, but essentially Anselm just thought that that's a bogus explanation in general, right? Everything has to have some type of explanation. So we can't just say nothing. So the final option is the only one left, it's that God's self-existent. And so Anselm says, hey, it, it's pretty difficult to understand what self-existence means, but we know that God has to be self-existent because he can't be any of the other two possibilities, right? If there's only three possibilities and we've eliminated two of them, we've only got that one left. So God must be explained in that way. Uh, so God has to be a self-existent being according to Anselm. So that's roughly why we would think self-existence is a thing. What does it amount to? Like I said, it's difficult, but just imagine uh, you somehow can explain your existence just by reference to your own sort of qualities, right? So by God being uh, eternal, so on and so forth, he can just appeal to himself, right, as an explanation for his existence. If that's difficult for you to understand, don't worry. Not too much is going to depend on that, depend on your understanding of what it means to be self-existent. Uh, let's see if we can make sense of the rest of the argument now, right? So the cosmological argument is doing something pretty simple, right? It's saying we have two options. 
every being that exists or ever did exist is dependent or self-existent, right? And if we have these two, well, it turns out not every being can be a dependent being. So now we've eliminated one and we're left with the only option. There has to be a self-existent being in existence. Right? So where's the major work being done here? Well, premise one is just making a claim about the two possible ways something could exist. Um, and that seems pretty self-evident, right? This seems pretty plausible, pretty clear. Uh, if you're going to question premise one, you have to come up with some other option, right? Another way in which a being could exist. Uh, that's going to be difficult. Uh, Anselm would claim impossible. Uh, and that seems plausible. Right? So a lot of the work is being done here by premise two. So premise two claims that not every being can be a dependent being. So let's see if we can make sense of that premise. Why can't every being be a dependent being? I'd suggest pausing and thinking about this for a minute because it's not abundantly clear from the get-go. Okay, hopefully you thought about it for a second. Not every being can be a dependent being. Why would that be? Well, think about it. If you have one being depending on another, 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 so on and so forth, on to infinity, right? You're going to have a big problem. You're going to have this infinite chain of things, right? And it's going to keep going, right? It's infinite. So there's no starting point, right? So we have this infinite chain and no way to account for why that chain exists, right? So we have this infinite set of things, however you want to picture it, and we don't have something else to explain it. So another way to picture this sort of thing. We have this whole entire group of things, this set of things here. It's an infinite group of things. And now what explains that infinite group? Well, if we appeal to another dependent being, that thing just gets sucked into the group, right? That's another dependent being added to the chain. So there has to be something outside this chain, infinite chain of dependent beings, to explain it. So it can't be dependent itself. It has to somehow be different than that, right? Uh, so if all we had were dependent beings, we'd have this infinite chain of dependent beings with nothing to explain why that exists. Why does that infinite group exist? So we need something outside it to explain why that group exists. Uh, hopefully that's making sense. So that's part of why not every being can be a dependent being, because then we lack an explanation for this infinite chain. Uh, if you had just a finite set of dependent beings, right, just say there were five beings in existence, uh, and somehow they all depended on one another for their existence, um, it's not clear how we can make sense of that. But once again, at this time we'd have a finite set of things, but once again we'd have no explanation for why that set of things exists. So whether or not you think it's finite or infinite, uh, infinite makes more sense, but whether or not you think it's finite or infinite, <coughs> you need something else to explain why that set of things exists in the first place. And that thing can't be dependent itself, otherwise it's just part of the set of things, of dependent things, right? And you end up getting into the regret. Okay, so not every being can be dependent, we need something outside it. We only have one other option, something that's self-existent, therefore there must be a self-existent being in existence. Okay, so hopefully you have a rough feel for how the argument works now. Um, realize that both premises depend on the truth of a specific proposition. It's normally known as the principle of sufficient reason. And roughly this is just saying that there has to be an explanation for the existence of any being and any positive fact whatsoever. So if you have a fact or a being, there has to be an explanation for why the fact is true or why the being exists. You can't just say it depends on nothing. Now, there might be some reason to doubt this, uh, 
But once again, we're going to split this into two sections, and that'll go in the objections video. So hopefully you have a rough idea of what's going on, right? <clears throat> There's only two options. One of them doesn't make sense, so it must be the other one. That's the general outline for this argument. Um, and if it can't be dependent, it must be self-existent. Well, guess what? Self-existent. God is. So hey, we have, once again, pretty good evidence that God exists. So once again, same, with the tele same as with the teleological argument. The conclusion of this argument isn't going to say, hey, God exists, but it is going to say, well, look, we have some support for the idea uh, that God exists because we've shown that a self-existent being uh, is actually in existence. So even if it doesn't give us God, it still gives us something important. It gives us one of our qualities. So remember when I was talking about the teleological argument, that gives us a designer. And I was saying maybe now we can use a bunch of other arguments to piece together all of the different qualities of God that we want. Uh, so the teleological argument gives us the designer, the creator. The cosmological argument gives us the self-existent bit. Uh, and we might need more arguments, obviously, to get the full conception of God. But hey, if we succeeded in these two arguments, we've come a really long way. Uh, okay, so we'll go on to objections in the next video. Thank you.